in around 1738, Captain Ulloa, a Portuguese explorer, who was uh, visiting Peru, Mount Pamela on a mountaintop, saw a very beautiful phenomenon. The sun was nearly setting, it was behind him. In front of him were some clouds, so the shadow of his head was on the cloud. But around the shadow of his head, he saw beautiful rings. He had companions. He didn't see a ring around their head. They saw the ring around each of their heads, but not around his head. So this picture is a, a, a misleading picture. Um, well, here's me standing uh, in Sicily on a mountain. It's on a place called Erice. And behind me is the is a, a temple of Venus, which was lit at night with bright lights. Some of that light hit my head down into the valley where there was mist. So again, this is the shadow of my head, glorified. There it is. You can see, and, it, and, and it's clear then that the cause of this phenomenon, somehow, is back reflection from mist. Okay, the little droplets somehow must reflect the light backwards. Of course, your head prevents you from seeing perfect back reflection, but uh, you can see almost back reflection uh, near the shadow of your head. So why is this? Well, let me show you some more pictures first. There's a better picture. And, uh, it's, it's easier nowadays to see this if you're uh, on, in an aeroplane and you're sitting in a window seat looking down at the shadow of the plane on the cloud. Uh, there you sometimes see this. I took a picture, not a very good one, um, uh, just to see down the bottom there when I was flying in the USA few months ago. Now then, imagine, here's the optics, that you have a ray which would hit the light a little drop and emerge backwards. Not like the rainbow at some angle, but backwards. So imagine this. These are the rays, and the ray comes in and comes out. If you have such a ray, then nearby rays would cross the axis, but then you have to realize that this picture is not a disc, it's a sphere. You rotate around and infinitely many rays would cross the axis, which would then be a focal line. Of course, it would be decorated by diffraction, giving you rings, but that's why you would see something bright. Now, this is actually used in uh, technology, because if you're driving along the motorway and you see the traffic signs in the night, your headlights light up these traffic signs. You don't want that light to go off and be reflected to see the cows in the fields. You want it to come back to you. And to do that, it very often happens that people put in the paint many, many thousands of tiny little plastic spheres, which through this mechanism reflect the light. Um, so this would be a backwards caustic again. However, it doesn't happen for water. It happens for plastic and other things. Why? Because um, a backward ray only exists if the refractive index is between the square root of 2 and 2. And with water, refractive is 1.3 something, it's less. So you don't have such a ray. So how can you explain the glory? Uh, you see, you have the most deflected ray is the one that grazes, and uh, it comes out at 14 degrees. It fails. It doesn't come backwards, and so in particular, it can't cross the axis. Now, this 14 degrees is compensated by surface waves which creep around and they reach backwards and beyond. So here are these surface waves. As they travel around, they get, they, 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 they get emitted, so they decay exponentially, but still some of them cross the axis and can give rise to this reflection. This was understood uh, in an approximate way. They give this enhanced back reflection. But the full explanation was extremely sophisticated, complicated was understood in marvelous research by Moises Nussensweig in the 1960s and 70s. And you have to start with Maxwell's equations, and then it's extremely complicated. These surface waves correspond to angular momentum, which is complex. And you need the same techniques that you use in nuclear physics to describe complex angular momentum. Things called wedging poles. It doesn't matter what they are. Um, but anyway, the result of this is a very detailed theory but I want to make a particular point about it, which he doesn't make, although he understands it, which is this. How bright is this back reflection? Well, there's a contribution that comes from the focusing, from this caustic backwards. 
and it uh, depends on the radius of the drop and the wavelength, and as the radius wavelength gets smaller, it gets larger and larger, and that's the usual enhancement of intensity by focusing. But these are not ordinary rays. These are evanescent, decaying waves, and uh, there's an additional factor which tells you, which, which gets smaller, the smaller the wavelength is, because the smaller the wavelength is, the more wavelengths it has to travel to skip those 14 degrees. So you get this very curious circumstance. You get a function that's small for small wavelengths and small for large wavelengths. Only intermediate sizes of drop compared to the wavelength, you think of it in terms of the size, give a substantial reflection, and that's why you don't see the glory in rain. You see it in mist, halfway between, in small few tens of, uh, tens of micron sizes of drops. So here's the point I want to make, the lesson from this particular phenomenon. The glory is a geometrical focusing effect, but it vanishes in the short wave limit. Um, because the waves, that are, the rays that are being focused are actually waves. So it's a very delicate interplay of ray physics and wave physics to describe this natural phenomenon. I haven't spoken about polarized light, but now I will. Um, in the blue sky above us, every day, daylight today, um, there is a beautiful pattern of polarized light that we can't see because our eyes are almost completely insensitive the polarization of light. That's the direction of vibration of the uh, electric field of light. Now, what is daylight? It's um, light scattered by molecules, which are much smaller than the wavelength. It's called dipole scattering. Um, the air is not very dense, and so approximately scattered only once. And it's a consequence of the fact that light is a transverse vibration, that although the sunlight isn't polarized, the emissions, the waves that come are randomly uh, oscillating transverse to the direction, still um, the very act of scattering induces polarization. And it's a calculation, it's a geometrical insight that the light that's scattered by a molecule at right angles is most strongly polarized. Now you can see that. You can take a piece of Polaroid and look at the sky and rotate. And when you're near the sun, you don't see any change. But when you're away from the sun, it goes bright and dark and maximum at right angles. Okay. Now, this uh, is the picture. If, uh, if you look in the direction of the sun itself, there should be an unpolarized point called a neutral point. Now, so this is the strength of polarization, strongly polarized away from the sun. And these are the directions of the uh, polarization. Also, the anti-sun, the same argument, which you see for a little time after the sun has set, the direction opposite to the sun, you see low in the sky. Now, these are polarization singularities. Why? Because when the polarization is zero, you can't detect the direction. Of index plus one. And there's something strange about that, which uh, I'll explain in a moment. But already long before Rayleigh understood polarization, it had been observed by Arago that actually the unpolarized point isn't at the opposite anti-sun, but about 10 degrees above. Here it is. And then shortly afterwards, Babinet observed there's an unpolarized point above the sun itself, and Brewster observed that there was one below the sun, more than you thought, and predicted that below the anti-sun was being one. That's hard to see. It was not seen until about 10 years ago by observations from a balloon. So now you've got these four. But from a modern point of view, it's not surprising. Because you don't expect an index one. Why? Because polarization isn't a vector that comes back to itself when you turn it once. It's a, it's a line. If you want to use representing the arrows, you should write a double arrow. And that's the same as when you rotate it by half a turn, 180 degrees. If you take a piece of Polaroid and look at some polarized light and turn it by 180 degrees, you see the same pattern. Um, okay, so that's how you should represent it. And why does this happen? Because light isn't scattered just once. It's mostly scattered once, but there's a small amount of multiple scattering which breaks a symmetry of sideways and up and down. Um, okay, 
So that means that uh, instead of an unpolarized point of the sun, you've got something, let's say, above and below. I've just drawn the one above here. I call this a polarization fingerprint because you see similar patterns on your fingers. Why? Because uh, the lines on your finger, the ridges on your fingerprint, are not uh, arrows, they're not vectors, they're just lines. And so you have the same singularity. This is one. There are other ones as well, just this. Okay. Now, there are f that means there are four singularities in the sky with index a half. The total index is plus two. There's a theorem of mathematics that tells you that this has to be true for any field of a sphere, deep theorem. So everything is consistent. Now, uh, Mark Dennis, who's also here, and you'll hear him next speak, um, and I, made the simplest theory based on this notion of the singularities. And we had Raymond Lee, who made observations in the USA, and uh, a beautiful comparison between theory and observation. These blue lines are the li theoretical lines tangent to which the polarization direction should be. And the observation are these little black lines and they agree really beautifully. Um, now, I want to make a mathematical point. Um, at each point in the sky, I call it Z, something like the polarization <coughs> direction, these blue lines, their contours are a function. It's a mathematical function that normally you don't associate with any observable phenomenon. It's called an elliptic integral. Don't worry about the details of it. But just to make the point that there exists in the sky every day, but we don't see it. Some creatures do, bees can, an elliptic integral. So it's an elliptic integral in the sky. Now, I want to say something else. We didn't publish this picture. I wish we had. We published a different picture. And the picture is, is this. Raymond uh, Lee measured the polarizations at points on a rectangular grid, some small grid of pixels, because of his particular experimental technique. But the grid deceives the eye. You see, look, I'm sure you agree with me that this doesn't look nearly as good as the previous picture, because what you see are the lines of the grid, especially near the middle here, and you, don't, you tend not to see what you should see, which are the directions of the little line segments. Well, we published a picture like this, and only later did we realize that we can eliminate this distortion effect caused by our perception by randomizing the positions of, the, uh, of these little line segments within, uh, within, a, uh, within each pixel. When you do that, um, you immediately get the picture. I've colored it differently, the picture I showed you before. So uh, that's a good illustration of how sometimes you have to be careful how you present data because you don't want the distorting effect of your perceptions to spoil the comparison between theory and experiment. So there we are. I don't have time to speak about another aspect of this sky polarization, which is the controversy about whether the Vikings, who had to sail from Norway to what we call Canada now, a thousand years ago, whether they used polarized light and naturally occurring crystals to, uh, uh, to navigate. Now, this is a long story, and I won't have time to go into it. It's a good story. It isn't finished yet. I rather doubt it, but there are people who believe it. There's no historical evidence for their opinions. Now I want to talk about, I mentioned crystals just now, about light in crystals, and briefly about that. Um, Hamilton, very great physicist, mathematician. Um, we know his name very well. I mean, certainly those of you who will study theoretical physics will see, or often write, papers that begin, we study the following Hamiltonian. His name is everywhere. But he taught us about uh, something called phase space, where you consider the positions and directions in mechanics and in optics in a similar way. And uh, he, what I'm going to describe to you is the first prediction that was made using this idea of direction and position in complementary ways and uh, it made a sensation, and it made Hamilton instantly famous. But it's a story that's hardly known nowadays, but it's very important in history. So I remind, I tell you about optics in crystals, uh, basic, before Hamilton. In any direction in a crystal, two waves can travel. They travel at slightly different speeds, and they have op 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 perpendicular polarizations. Right, here's, there's the picture. Now you can. Uh, represent some of this structure by something called the Fresnel wave surface. And that's a polar plot 
of the two refractive indices, the two velocities. Here's uh, what you do. You take, uh, this is the space of directions, and you go out in the direction of your wave, and you mark off the two points corresponding to the distances from the origin of the two refractive indices. When you go from direction to direction, you get two surfaces. These are the Fresnel wave surfaces, but we generally call it the wave surface. Now, for the most general crystal, where all three directions are different, this has a curious property. It has two sheets. They intersect at four points lying on two axes. So these are all biaxial crystals. Okay. Now, Hamilton realized that these cones are interesting. Previous people had not understood them. And, uh, well, so he looked at detail, a detailed structure here. It's a double cone. A double cone in English is a diabolo, so you can call this Hamilton's diabolical point. Now, this occurs in many areas of physics. We know now it comes from fundamental mathematical properties involving matrices. And uh, this is the first conical intersection in physics. Nowadays, in some areas, of fashionable areas of physics, people call these Dirac points. That's a misnomer. They should really be called Hamilton points. Because everything about them, which is used in the modern condensed matter physics, where it's describing electrons, very different physics from this, but the same structure, uh, was already noted by Hamilton. Never mind. Um, he knew another thing. He knew that in a crystal, the wave direction, perpendicular to the wave points, is not the same as the ray direction, along which energy flows. Um, this is uh, w w what he knew. And uh, in fact, he also knew the rule that the rays are at right angles to the wave surface. So here's the wave direction, here's the ray direction. Now, because there are two surfaces, for most directions, you will have, uh, uh, you have two waves and you have two rays. That's why this whole subject is called biorefringence optics, except where near this direction where the two surfaces intersect in a diabolical direction. And then the cone of waves generates a complementary cone at right angles, infinitely many rays. Um, wave cone, ray cone, at right angles. Now, Hamilton realized you could see this if you took a crystal, uh, cut it at right angles to one of these directions, they're called optic axes, and shone a beam of light in, and you'd get a cone inside it sideways, never mind why. And then when it came out again, it would be refracted into a hollow cylinder, which you would see as a bright ring. This was observed by Humphrey Lloyd. Now, when you do this experiment, this is the experiment that, that, that I did with, it, with my student, Mike Jeffrey, uh, if you uh, observe this, you never quite get the direction 